I'm ready. Call this meeting back to order at 637. So the first item on the agenda is always public input. If there's anybody that has anything you'd like to bring, for, bring before the committee that is not on the agenda tonight, seeing none, we move to our first student report of the year. Madam President. I, you really, you don't need to, it's okay. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for having us. Um, you'll be meeting a few new faces this year, so be nice, but I'm sure you will be. Um, and they're excited to present as well. So um, starting off with some athletic matters, boys soccer, girls soccer, volleyball, field hockey, and football all made it to their state tournaments. Um, some are still competing in those, and we're going to be finding about the results like throughout the week. Um, and congratulations to Field Hockey for accomplishing this for the first time since 2014. So that's very exciting. We're super happy for them. Um, Girls Cross Country won the Cal Sportsmanship Award this year. And senior Lindsay McClellan was the Cal Championship for all of Cross Country, which is really exciting. And she just committed to a D1 school for track and cross country, Lehigh, down in Pennsylvania. So super exciting news for her. She's great and very humble. So very exciting overall. Um, Cheer is going to be hosting the Cal Championship here at NRHS on Thursday at 7 p.m. in the gym. Um, and overall, it was a really strong fall season. Um, over 300 students participated, and sports awards are going to be on November 12th to close out that season. For some academic matters, um, everyone in the high school now is participating in the one-to-one -one Chromebook program. Um, it's been very successful, and definitely, I think every student has had a really positive reaction. Um, it's great for classes because it's a lot easier to just like have your Chromebook with you and there's no issues of bringing the carts back and forth. So overall, a really great program that's working well for everyone. Um, the PSATs were hosted on October 9th here for sophomores and juniors. And then Sam Ryan, who's a specialist in genetics and who studies um, developing technologies in genetics, <coughs> was brought to North Reading on October 25th for the AP Bio classes and the genetics and bioethics classes. And he presented for the entire morning, and we were able to invite other students from other schools so they could listen to him. It was very interesting, um, crazy, crazy information. So very cool to have him here. And then Academic Decathlon will be competing on November 23rd at Quincy High School, and it's their first competition of the year. Um, for some fine arts matters, Maskers hosted the Haunted Playground on October 19th. It was a great success um, and a really awesome community program to bring back from Martin's Pond, so really great there. Um, Notorious competed in the Haunted Harmonies competition in Salem on October 5th, and Austin Stemegna won an individual award, and then the group won for their best costume award. And Marching Band is having a spectacular year so far. Um, they won silver at MICA Finals, which is really exciting for them um, at Lawrence High School. And they came in second at Nesbo, which is another competition they compete in. So really exciting for them, kind of a breakout year. So they're great to listen to. They've been great at the football game. So really enjoyable to watch, for sure. Um, do you have any questions before I pass around my student work? Any comments or questions? What did they dress up as when they won the costume award? Um, they were like steampunk zombies, kind of. Yeah, I think it was like an ambiguous costume with a lot of makeup, so that sold it. <laughs> did anybody go to the haunted uh, playground? Yeah, I did. Was yeah. that great? It was Michael, great. you went, didn't you? Oh, I did. <laughs> yes, I did. Oh, it was yeah, great. No, we went. My, my, yeah, my kids loved it. Yeah, I mean, I, th I, thought, I thought the haunted playground was done very well, and just the kids, I mean, it's just it's a nice time to get the kids out with the community as well, which is important, and... I think the younger kids really like seeing the older kids. And I mean, there were other people that didn't have kids and that were just wandering through as well. And so it's always a good representation of the school. So I appreciate the maskers taking that on this year. Um, I also know that Mel Webster said the boys soccer won three to one today. So <laughs> you reported back. Quarter. <laughs> awesome. So I have an essay here from AP Lit. I can pass it around. The first page is like where the essay starts and then it ends where the loose leaf papers are. Um, and the first one is the rubric, and then the next one is some essay planning. Um, and it was on Pride and Prejudice, which is a thick read, but very good. Um, and I talked about um, one of the scenes in there and the social implications it has for like the setting. So very, I enjoyed the book very much. It just took a little bit of a time, <laughs> but it was very good. Yes. Any questions so I can answer or anything? read the whole thing. I don't think oh. so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. Enjoy homecoming. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I'll get that back to you. Brian. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. We have no continuing business, but either way, we'll go to the new business. We have a lot of proposals tonight, so 
I think we're going to begin with the International Travel Club trip. Someone wants to present on this. Do you need the PowerPoint? I sent it to you. Yeah, you're, are you going to use the screen now? Yeah. Today? You do? Yep. Yeah. <coughs> want us to go they, they, all, they all have a copy, too, okay. if you want. Is it on? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, who's on deck? I'm just kidding. Uh, let's see if it'd be easier to do this. Is that it? Yeah. Was there a Google Doc? Take one second. If you want to log into you, um, Patrick, and I'll send it. Place. I'd love to go. There you are. Good. Thank you. Okay, so um, we are very happy to be here. This is our seventh trip we're proposing, which is very exciting. And um, thanks. And we're hoping that. This coming April, we'll be able to go to Japan um, over the April vacation. This is the itinerary, which is very exciting. Um, we start in Tokyo. We go to a few cities on the way to Kyoto. <clears throat> and then we wrap up in Kyoto and fly home from there. And it's a nine-day trip. Um, they've all been about nine or 10 days over the past seven years. And this will be our 17th country bringing kids on, which is very exciting. And did some math today, and over the past seven years, we brought 200 kids overseas, um, including you. You came last year, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very exciting itinerary. Um, we're, we're very excited about it. Um, as with past trips, um, the total per student cost includes insurance that's with EF, and then also um, the supplemental insurance that the district, you know, we work out with, with the district. Um, and this covers their tour cancellation if they had to, if they got sick or something like that. Uh, it covers if they got sick overseas or if there was some sort of accident, covers any sort of baggage issues, um, flight delay, and the parents have 24 hour access to uh, an English speaking representative. The EF has an office in Boston, you can see it when you drive into the city, uh, and there are people there. And they also have offices all over the world. Um, and the, the students, this is included in the, in the price that they pay. And then a few years ago, we um, came up sort of as international travel club advisors with sort of our travel goals and um, you know, why we do this, why these trips are, are good for our, our kids. And this is that information here. I know as a teacher and someone who's gone on these trips with them, this is um, some of the best teaching I get to do is when we get to travel with them. Excellent. Questions? Anyone? Is it fly on Friday night or Saturday? And then um, on Sunday? I request like a, a date basically and they give me a range. I think this last trip we left on a Thursday night and we came back on a Saturday night. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or Friday night. What's the cost of the, of the trip? Um, so this trip is $4,000, which is a little more than this year's Ecuador trip, but in line with past trips. 
and there is a $200 early enrollment discount and stuff that EF does with the kids. They take care of all the, the money stuff with them. You need a chaperone? <laughs> <laughs> how, many, how many kids are in the travel club? So it changes based on the size of the trip. This year we're bringing 35 to Ecuador. Last year we brought, I think, 42 to Eastern Europe. This trip, can, um, well, there's 37 spots available for the kids. Okay. Um, what kinds of fundraising things do you do to try and alleviate the, the extreme cost for? We do bake sales, which we, we do very well at, surprisingly. The kids like their Oreo balls. And then we do, uh, we do a Fuddruckers night for each, with each trip. Yep. And there's two $250 scholarships available that kids um, Excellent. try to get, yeah. Mr. Bernard? I was just going to add Mr. Buckley and, and to the members of the committee that um, Mr. Votto and Mr. Nosey have been running these trips, the lead organizers, for many years. Um, in my opinion, they've done an outstanding job. They're organized. They're attentive to the questions that parents have. They run, they run informational meetings, mandatory informational meetings with the parents. So in, in, in whole, I would just say to you that I do... Um, I do endorse this trip, even though I won't be here um, in 2021. But um, I'm just the, the record that they have, um, and the students on the trips too, I think, are what keep us coming back each year to propose um, another trip. We're very proud of the way our students, um, you know, take part in these trips as well. So I would offer my my endorsement of it. Yes, and Chris? one more question. Yeah. Uh, given that it's it's you know, a limited number of spots, and mm -hmm. I'm sure that the interest is, is very high for the students, uh, is there a sort of selection process, or how do you how do you? Feel it's first come first okay. serve. We just bring sophomores to seniors and gotcha. sign up. Yep, okay. and there's a waiting list too, so kids can get on later if a kid drops out or something happens. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just I would just add to what Mr. Bernard said. I mean, I've only been here a couple of years, a couple, few years now, but um, in presentations come up every year about the different trips and. You never hear any problems with any of these trips. It's a great opportunity that you know expands the learning beyond the classroom. And you know, I mean, with a with a global economy these days, it's mm -hmm. it, it's important. I mean, it's something I was never introduced to when I was younger, and I think it's great that students have that opportunity. So I think it's great, great that you guys do that. So thank you. Okay, we want to vote to approve this trip. Is that the language you use, yes, Bernard? Please. Yes, please. Okay, can I have a motion <clears throat> to approve the International Travel Club's trip to Japan? I make a motion to approve the International Travel Club trip to Japan in 2021. A second? second. Janine, second? Yes. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to do it Thursday night. Next, we have the North Reading High School Adventure Club trip. Do you, want, do you have the PowerPoint, Michael? Do you want to use that? I can email it to Patrick. Was it a physical reaction? It's not true. It was a Google Doc. Patrick, can you just, I'm going to send you another document. I am. Should have it right now. All right. This is the uh, Adventure Club trip proposals for this coming school year. I'm uh, Mr. Michael Votto. I'm the club advisor, and I'll let my officers introduce themselves. I'm uh, Matthew Kahn. And I'm Ethan Felmas. And the other two gentlemen on the list are at that soccer game that uh, they just won 3-1. <laughs> oh, congrats. So it's going to be a two-night trip um, proposed. We're going to Loon Mountain, which is exactly what we did last year. Um, and it's January 10th to the 12th. Um, so that doesn't fall in line with midterms, and it's the weekend after we get back. So it's a full week, and then we go um, after the December vacation. So included in this trip, we have two nights. We're staying at the Indian Head Resort. Uh, it, that covers the 
transportation to the resort as well as to the mountain and then back home. We have two days of skiing, which will be the Saturday and the Sunday, two breakfasts and two dinners at the resort. Uh, we have a tour guide, and then this covers taxes and a complimentary package with every 10 full packages paid. So uh, the cost of the trip is based off of the uh, 22 people that we'll bring. Um, uh, as well as the two complimentary chaperones that we'll bring. So that'll be about $435 per person for the trip. Some other trips that we've done and are planning to do, uh, we've done rock climbing the past couple of years. This year we're looking for Central Rock Gym, uh, potentially a hike in Fellsway Reserva Reservation, excuse me, uh, maybe a day ski trip, which we did, I believe, two years ago. Uh, a whitewater rafting trip later in June, and go-kart racing. <laughs> so, uh, as, as I said previously, the uh, two chaperones that we'll, be like, we'll like to bring is probably uh, Mr. Vado and uh, Mr. Falanga. So. And this is a company that we've used in the past, Ski93, um, and they've been great, and so we're continuing to use them. And their contact is right there, and my email and my cell phone are there if you have any questions as well. Thank you very much. I'm Comments, a questions? Skier, so is that a good price for the for two passes, the night stay, dinners, and everything? Yeah, I would say it's a it's a pretty good price if you're getting the two nights there at a pretty nice place. It's got a pool and a hot tub and a game room, um, the dinners and yeah. pretty much everything. It's pretty it's a pretty good price for kids to hang out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a good value. I mean, I'm kind of surprised only 22. There's 40 people going to Japan. Me too. Yeah. Going to Loon Mountain. <laughs> it more skiing or snowboarders now? What do you think? I would guess. Yeah, I would guess skiing. I don't know. Though. Not for a while. It's like everybody's snowboarding. It was the 90s. Yeah, must be. Wild ones. <laughs> okay. Other questions or comments? Okay, if none, then I think we'll, uh, I need a motion to approve the Adventure Club trip to Loon Mountain. I'll make a motion to approve the Adventure Club trip to Loon Mountain. I'll second it. Okay, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. When's the next soccer game? Thank you, guys. What? That's right. I know. Hmm? Okay, the next trip, the hockey team trip. Mr. Vado, are you going on this one too, the hockey trip? Or? So the, yeah, this, this is, uh, Mr. Chairman, this is no, there's no presentation on this one. It's just, I think it's... Okay, we have a hockey it, trip. It, it's, a, it's a traditional invitational tournament that our, our varsity hockey team participates in. It's an overnight trip. Um, we've had good, again, similar to the other presentations, we've had a good experience with... Um, with our students participating. The parent service, chaperones, and transportation as well. Mr. Lepret's here. Mr. Lepret, I don't know if any issues with this from, no, your, I mean, from your office? It's always a nice opportunity uh, for the to go down there and see that tournament. It's a lot of positive experiences with that. So. Thank you. Okay, we need a motion to approve this as well. Okay, can I have a motion to approve the hockey trip? I'll, I will move to approve the hockey trip to the uh, tournament in Sandwich. February. I'll second that one as well. Okay, any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Mr. LaPrat, Principal LaPrat. Thank you. So I am uh, presenting on uh, proposals that I believe you have in your packet. Um, I have the uh, senior class representatives here with me. You have a here? Um, Certainly. Uh, so the, uh, the senior class officers um, met with myself. They requested a meeting in, in August. Uh, <coughs> met with myself and Mr. Hain, the assistant principal, and spoke about, um, I'll say, reinstituting um, uh, a practice that had been in place um, 
through the uh, 1990s, 2000s, and ended around 2000, uh, the 2004, 2005 school year, a senior final exam exemption practice. Um, I asked them to go back and do some research and uh, convince me why this was a good idea. I think they did an excellent job. They uh, investigated other area high schools. Uh, a number, m many more than I thought, had actually had this practice in place. Um, they spoke about um, rewarding hard work, recognizing um, superiority and uh, excellence in performance. They spoke about um, student wellness and the number of uh, stressors that might be in place for students around final exams. Um, and all in all made a very convincing argument. We sat down and did some more research together about um, what a practice like this might look like. Uh, and, and you have the, uh, the final draft in your hands. And I'm hoping that um, that, that gets approved. It's a two-year pilot program. So for the class of 2020 and 2021, and that two-year approach kind of allows us to assess um, if after two years we still think it's happening for the right reasons and, and that uh, we see, um, I think, one of the side benefits of maybe the, uh, the reduction of the quote-unquote senior slide, um, if that, uh, in, in fact, really does exist, if it's not a myth. Um, so uh, I think this, the, the, the language that you have in front of you, I feel um, really encapsulates the spirit of the idea. Um, it preserves the integrity of the academic work and allows us to uh, assess after two years and, and see if it's still something we, we, we think is the right thing to do. Okay. Any students have any additional comments they'd like to add or? If so, we should give you a mic. The point of having the 93 or above on the GPA scale, that's a 4.0. And the students, I believe there's about three or four students who actually have a 4.0 GPA. So that's very, very hard to obtain, even just in a single class. So it really is pushing students to work their hard all year. And in return, they get out of a few finals. Anything else? Okay. Um, Comments, questions from the committee? Yeah, so we have a, a, a similar policy to this uh, at Wakefield High School, which you guys probably came across when you were looking at them. Uh, and knowing how that one works and, and the pitfalls in it, I'd like to say that this is a particularly well thought out approach to this. This is a really well written document that I think foresees any problems and then, and then addresses them and, uh, and really goes to the spirit you're talking about without compromising along the way. So I commend you on that. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, Janine? If I could just respond, I, I really I appreciate the, that. Um, I will say, you know, working with this uh, this group of student leaders has been a really um, rewarding experience for me. Uh, we meet in the morning. Um, it's it's thoughtful. Uh, there's follow through. There's uh, again, I think a, a real understanding of the spirit of the school and the spirit of the education, and then working together to to. Uh, reach a place that we're comfortable with them. So thank you. Sure. Um, you had said that it was, it had been done in the past. It had been in place in the past, yes. Um, I'm assuming you were the high school principal at the time? I was. And so then why did it stop? Was, can you, or both of you feel is, as to why? Yeah, I don't remember. It was 2005. <laughs> well, so when you, you, you I was the principal role. and I did, I was the, uh, I was the principal at the time that worked with students at that time to eliminate the senior final exam provision. My record, and Mr. LaPrette and I have been talking about this for you know a couple of months since you know, really when you sure. first met with the students in, in, in the summer. So I was up to speed with it. And, and I think you know, there's a couple of things that I, I can remember at that time and th things I see in this document that I think draw some pretty stark um, contrast. It's, I think we're at a different time, number one. Um, it was 2005 and I think we're at a different time. One of the things that really resonated with me um, in, in Mr. LaPrette's opening comment about student wellness 
is something that I think we are in a different place in what our what our students are doing to challenge themselves. You know, I've talked often about the advanced placement program and, and how in 2003, when I became the principal, we administered 87 exams at the advanced placement level. We're, we're, we're administering over 400 now. We had eight advanced placement courses at that time at the high school. We have 17 now. And I, I have been very pleased and proud over the years as um, I've been witness to our students and their seriousness of purpose. And so I think they're taking on more and they're dealing with a lot more and they're challenged a lot more and they're performing at a level in, in courses that, that we did not have in 2005. And I also think that there were, and again, I had been principal for two years at that time. And I think to the, to the, to the point about pitfalls, I thought that was a good word, Chris. You know, there, I think there were, there were pitfalls that were not addressed and it was, um, the attention to detail did not exist then that I felt needed to exist, and I think that this, this document does do a good job in capturing that. I think they, Mr. LaPrette and Mr. Hain and, and the young ladies in, in front of you have done a good job of anticipating all of the things, because I, they want this to work, and I think that they want this to work beyond their graduating class, and I think they've done a nice job working with the administration mm -hmm. to, um, to try and you know anticipate all of the things that might come up, all of the questions along the way, and I don't, I don't think it was mentioned about the involvement that you all had with the faculty, the teachers of the high school, oh, sure. and, present, and presenting Excellent to them point. and gathering some data. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. And working with them too, so that this, you know, I really think that there was a, a good, concerted effort to 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 kind of recognize that we were doing this not to necessarily get out of work. In fact, I think it's just the opposite. It's that we're going to try to do what we need to do over the, you know, say the, the eight months preceding, um, you know, the time when, when final exams are, are being thought about uh, being administered. And I think that they've done a nice job kind of trying to, trying to work with everybody in a spirit of a, you know, a purpose that's, that's commendable. And it's not just about, you know, trying to slack off at the end of the year. So is it fair to They're say? They're taking advanced, pla I mean, advanced placement exams are not, yeah. you know, part, yeah. of, are yeah. not part of this, right? Yeah, You're still holding to that that I instituted when I was principal, right? We're still gonna take the exams. But I think, you know, there, and it's, there's, a, I think, a good question that can be asked about, well, if I'm taking an advanced placement examination, that really is the culminating exam of my right. work in an advanced placement course. Not that, not that everybody's taking all advanced placement courses, but there are a number. And I think that, you know, we're still, we're still recognizing and we will uphold the, the, the recognition of um, academic rigor and that that's, you know, our primary purpose here is to educate and our primary purpose of our students is to learn. And I think they'll, you know, I'm confident knowing what I know of, uh, of our students here that they will continue to, to recognize and work toward that. Uh, on your comment then, is the faculty behind this as well? It, it, it is absolutely. This? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Other comments, Ms. Just out Adriano? of curiosity, does that include midterms, <laughs> or you still have to do no. the midterms? <laughs> you still have to take midterms. Other comments, questions? I, I have, have some after. I have a, a couple of questions. One, so the 93% average is for the individual class, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. The, yeah, the, student, the student in that one class, yeah. And so is there <clears> some <throat> provision for um, if a student is, is, for lack of a better word, underperforming in a number of other classes, um, do you, would it still be appropriate to to sort of uh, exempt them from the exam in this class? Sure. So I think that's an excellent question. Um, we uh, we do identify that the student um, essentially shall be in good standing, um, and that means attendance and uh, I think lack due, due effort um, in in all the other courses. Um, to qualify, to still you know, qualify for the exemption. Uh, I think if a student has a particular interest and works really hard and, and again, earns that mm -hmm. recognition of superiority with respect to content and skill, um, then that's the spirit of, the, of this language. Um, students are, you know, may struggle in other areas. Um, we don't want to see somebody just deciding not to do, you know, take it light, but um, it is about recognizing the hard work that got the, uh, the 93 or above. Okay. Any Aldrich? Or? I mean, I have two questions and some comments, but the, my two questions are what, what percentage of the final grade is typically the final exam? Do you know? So as, or, as far <coughs> as this, it's 10%. Okay, so it's, so it's only 10% of the final grade typically. And then, and do you know if have you looked at like last year, what percentage of students would not have taken it? I question. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so last year, 
um, of the 187 students that graduated, 151 students one time essentially had uh, a 93 or above. So there would have been 151 individual students that would have missed one exam. Um, but overall, there were of the, of the say, over 1,500 total tests, there were just, just under, let's say, a third. <coughs> Um, 93 or above. So 157 students would have missed at one, least. 151. 51 would have missed at least one. One, yep. And the total ac across all those 151 is a third of the 1,500. Correct. <laughs> Correct. And that's, that, that's last year's. Just to restate what you just said. But <laughs> that's last year's. <clears throat> yep. Okay. Interesting. I mean, I think, I mean, my big, the biggest thing I'm upset about is that I didn't think of this when I was in high school. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, being being serious, I mean, I think I, I think testing is so arbitrary, and I think that people do. The point of education is to learn, not necessarily to be tested and be able to repeat it. And so, if somebody has done very well to show throughout the year that they've learned, I mean, I think I agree that there's probably no no use. I mean, I did did well enough in high school, and you know, you know it, and it's just. It's not that you can't cram to learn it, it to remember what you learned six months ago, but it's just I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how much value there is in that overall, and so so I appreciate that part of it. Um, so I'd be in support of this. Are there any other final comments? Uh, just just go ahead. Two two short things. Uh, the first is uh, looking at this from the perspective of as a perk for high performing seniors. Are there any other such perks at the school right now apart from success in schoolwork? Parking. <laughs> okay. That's not necessarily high performing. <laughs> but that's, that's more of a senior perk, but not necessarily tied to academic. Yeah, no. Okay. Mm, okay. And then, uh, you know, sometimes it's like lighter study halls, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, the other question would be, has there been a conversation or a thought about if uh, this is adopted and successfully implemented of this becoming a rule not just for seniors? Um, I think our primary focus was on seniors just because it's a reward after four years because I'm just going to make like a blanket statement here, but typically if you have 93 or above in classes, you've been working consistently hard because you can't get a 93 in AP Calculus if you didn't pay attention in geometry. Um, so yeah, I think that was mainly our thinking, but I think students would be open to having it for <laughs> I can imagine. I can imagine what the I think that was a conversation that I, I, I think Emily really raises it when um, she talks about the, the base of non school right? Mm -hmm. For a senior at that point of the level of academic depth of knowledge to be able to say, I you know, I really have demonstrated this much to carry this grade um, in this content that the foundation is there, I I would I'll say I am reluctant to extend it to <coughs> lower grades, uh, you know, at the, you know, prima facie discussion, but, um, you know, we'll see. Sure. The, the only other comment that I would have would be that with any pilot program, the point of a pilot program is to test things. Mm -hmm. And so I, I would encourage you to have some data that comes from that, whether you do a student survey of both of all the students and then all the faculty as well. Look at, I mean, I do think that's important. So if we're going to be testing this and presumably if it, you know, if people think it goes well, they're going to want, you know, it to be a, a long-term thing. But I do think, or again, maybe expansion or something like that, but I do think it's important that you really have a conversation about how are you going to test if this worked or did not work. And so really think about doing surveys. I don't know what other data you can gather on that, but mm -hmm. I think that, you know, with anything with education, a lot of it's data-driven now. And so I think it's important that you really think about how you can determine at the end of this two years if it was successful, especially since you won't be here. So it would be important for somebody to have that date at the end. If I could just go back, as I mentioned, the, the, um, the <coughs> average scoring piece. Yep. So that 10%, um, that the, the, the final grade, the system works where we, you, we can put in a character that the computer essentially ignores and calculates without that number. Yep. So that's how that that total average will be, you know, <coughs> would be calculated, just in absence of yeah. this other piece. Nice in that part, yeah, perfect. Thank you. So I think, 
And, and I should also note, I appreciate people dressing up for our committee. <laughs> the homecoming? The homecoming yeah. dance. I know. <laughs> I assumed it was for us. I'm just kidding. Okay, so we need a vote to approve the uh, amendment to the handbook for both the student and the parent handbook. Can I have a motion? I make a motion to, uh, to amend the North Reading High School handbook for students and parents to include a pilot program for two years regarding final exam exemptions. Second. Okay. More discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done, Ross. Yeah. Yeah, great job. High school's four for four tonight. That's good. <laughs> Look at that. Thank you, ladies. Part of the dance. Mr. Pratt, thank you. Thank you. Oh, think we were going to vote that down? Thank you. <laughs> no. I was interested in hearing. Yeah, they did a nice job. Only question that wasn't would, fully asked. Would he first told answer. Answer. I was like, what? Sir? I just, well, the only question, I, I was just wondering why it was coming about. So, I still don't know exactly why it went away, but. Nice job. Where is homecoming <laughs> being held? Is it in the, the gym? Union? Yeah. yeah. They went because the students have don't have school tomorrow. <clears throat> it's a professional development day. Oh, yeah. So that's why it's tonight. Oh, smart. Yeah. What time does it start? Oh, yeah. It's now. Now? <laughs> <laughs> they, were dying, they were dying to get there, I'm sure. <clears throat> they probably should have jumped on the head with that. Okay. Now it's Dr. Daly time. Okay. Dr. Daly, would you like to talk about the accountability data? Thank you, folks. So we have two uh, brief presentations tonight. Um, the first is our annual accountability and MCAS presentation. And um, I will start off with some slides that will just give a little bit of background on some of the changes, a little bit of an overview of the system. Without getting into too much detail, I do know that you folks are, are familiar with this from previous presentations. But if you have questions, let me know. I then get into an overview of our scores and our achievements this year. So just a few changes for this year. This is the second year of the new uh, accountability system. This is the first year that the high school is a part of um, the new MCAS testing, so the results are a little bit different. Um, they added, for accountability, they added some uh, new courses to advanced coursework. One of the things that you get points for is how many students participate in advanced courses. So they've included these programs called Project Lead the Way. We don't currently have those classes here, but um, the participation rate was calculated a little bit differently for the all students category. Um, they now have two years of data. So if you go back a few years, the old system up through 2017, you were weighted, there were four years of data that was weighted, um, with the most recent years being weighted the most heavily and then a little bit. So for this year, there are two years of data. Uh, 2018 is at 40%, 2019 is 60%. They do plan to return to a four-year formula, I believe. That is, that is where they will be heading um, for future years. And there were some language changes around the uh, progress toward improvement of targets. They framed some of the language in positive ways, which uh, I think that the new categories of meeting or exceeding substantial progress, moderate progress, and limited or no progress uh, was a step forward. So they had some sessions for us to go and provide feedback. Uh, they had surveys, they had, they had uh, sessions, and they did, they did reflect a lot on some of the things that we said, and, and uh, we did see some of those changes presented here. I'll go quickly through this one because the non-high school weighting is very similar to the high school with the exception of one uh, category that's different. So um, all schools are measured on achievement, student growth, English language proficiency, and then these additional uh, indicators of chronic absenteeism and advanced coursework that is for high school for the advanced coursework. And the high school completion, obviously, is, is unique to high schools. Um, there is two different weighting categories. They took into account whether you had a certain percentage of, of English learners. So we, are, we fall into the category here on the far right side. 
um, because uh, we don't we don't have the the requisite number of English learner students to to meet there. So the the weight distribution for those is balanced as you can see on the the chart on the right. So that's just the overview of how the scores are arrived at. These again are the way schools are classified. So School of Recognition is sort of top of the line. That's after you've been uh, meeting or exceeding targets. Certain schools are recognized as schools of recognition. But if you're in the meeting or exceeding targets, substantial progress towards or moderate progress towards, um, those are the, the places where, you, where you'd like to be. Within each category, there are four points. Targets are set. If you decline, you get zero. No change, one. Improved is two. Met target or exceeded target. And you can see with the orange highlights there, these are the, you want to be in one of those categories, the improved, the met target, or the exceeded target is where you want to be working towards. Obviously, exceeding is the best, but um, all three of those categories are, are where you hope to be. And again, very similar, the high school, the non-high school and the high school, the high school is just going to have a few more areas. But this is just a 30,000 foot view of how this is all tabulated. All of this is available on the website to show you some of the uh, more granular detail of where the, the scores come from. But you can get between zero, and this is, this is not our school, by the way. This is just a sample. But you can get between zero and four points, how many points were earned. It shows you the different weights. It then gives you a score at the bottom. And it takes both the all students category and also your lowest performing. So they calculate the lowest 25% um, of students, the lowest performing, and you get a score for that. So you're always being held accountable not only for your all students, but also for your lowest achievements. So you want to close those gaps and make sure that your lowest achievers are making gains through interventions and supports and resources. So those two come together to get you that 62%. Again, this is just generic data from the Department of Ed. In addition to that, there is also a normative component. There's an accountability percentile between 1 and 99. And this compares uh, your school to other comparable schools of that same area. So it, it compares high schools to high schools. It compares actually middle schools are compared to all schools three to, uh, K to 8. Three to eight is the testing areas. Okay, so just some important things to keep in mind when we look at the data. The 2018 percentile should not be compared to the previous 2012 to 2017. Um, and the same for 2019. We should be cautious when we compare even 18 to 19 because um, last year there was only that one year of data. It wasn't weighted with the two years of data. So you, you do, especially as we're getting into this system where until we get to those four years, um, right now, we don't want to compare year to year too much. And uh, we should not be comparing the percentiles across grade spans. So you should not look at a high school score and compare it to an elementary score because it's apples uh, to oranges. So what I did here is I just prepared um, overall from you know, the large view. Here is our percentage towards targets, our accountability percentiles, and our achievement levels. And I can tell you, um, I think you can see the scores, that they're very high and very good. The schools, the district as a whole, the Batchelder, the uh, J. Turner Hood, and the EFO Little School um, are all at meeting or exceeding targets for achievement level. North Reading Middle School and North Reading High School are both at substantial progress towards their targets. And um, the accountability percentiles are all very high as well. Some highlights that I decided to pull out, some qualitative information. The Batchelder School is recognized for high achievement for exceeding targets. It was a school of recognition both last year and again this year in 2019. The Hood School is number four in the state for grade five students scoring, meeting, or exceeding on the fifth grade science, technology, and engineering. So that's pretty exciting for the Hood School. And the, the Little School, as you know, is not only um, recognized as a school of recognition in 2018, but they are now a national blue ribbon school recognizing their performance in 2018 and 2019. <coughs> and we'll be heading to Washington, D.C. to celebrate that uh, great honor as well. So very proud of our elementary schools. For our three elementary schools together, uh, our number three in Massachusetts overall for science, technology, and engineering for those grade five scores. Um, very impressive um, if you look at those three schools together. I pulled out for the North Reading Middle School and North Reading High School when, when I said that you know, getting those four points, getting exceeds um, is, is, is a goal. Middle school 10 times and the high school 22 times exceeded their targets. And I just like, I, every year I like to point out that how difficult it is to hit those targets when you're already there. There's what's called the ceiling effect in the data 
where your scores are very high, it's very difficult to get from you know, 98 to 99 percent in, in a certain sub area. And uh, I think it's pretty impressive to see that 10 and 22 times they're able to exceed their targets. That covers everything from math, ELA, science, and then also growth, also areas such as dropout prevention, retention, uh, chronic absenteeism, um, and, and the like. So very good, uh, very good highlight there. And again, only 67 schools in Massachusetts out of uh, over 1,800 were recognized as schools of recognition, and the Batchelder School this year, again, is one of our 67 in the state. So we're, we're very proud of the, uh, the achievement of our schools and the continued excellence. So for the MCAS results specifically, just to give you some more information here, I pulled out um, English language arts, meeting or exceeding expectations. So taking the two highest achievement levels where you expect our students to be and seeing where North Reading is. We don't often compare to the state average uh, because we, ex we exceed the state average by quite a bit. But I put it in there just so you can see when we do, when there, when there is a trend at a grade level, I don't want you to think that uh, it's certainly the, the same pattern is, is visible for the state. So you can see in the grade levels where it dips a little bit, um, you can see a similar dip at the state level as well. Um, and we still are maintaining um, that, we're, that we're above the, the grade level. Um, that's for ELA. For mathematics, uh, similar. Um, and again, you see the percentages for meeting and exceeding. And by comparison, you are also seeing how um, we are doing against the state average there. For science, technology, and engineering, these are very impressive. As we said, number three in the state there for grade five. You can see uh, quite, a, quite an increase there above where the rest of the state is with science technology and engineering. And we continue that in middle school and in high school as well. <clears throat> so for the spring of 2020, uh, as far as testing goes, all of the exams, grades 3 to 8, 10, including ELA math, and also now, for the first time, high school biology also. Everything is on computers. Um, we're very excited this. Our, our district is well positioned. We've, we've tested on our devices for many years. We're in a good place with that. We last year were able to pilot um, in, a, in a way that was not possible on paper. Having multiple grade levels testing on the same day just was not feasible with bins and boxes and paper and assignments. Um, and, and we're fairly confident at the middle school that we might be able to get um, two if not all three <coughs> grades testing on some of the same days, which then eliminates just the number of days that we have to interrupt everyone's learning for scheduling. So that's a huge advantage for, for computer-based that we've had to take some time, but now that's another advantage with the way we've rolled out our Chromebook system where the district owns the devices, we take them in, we put, we put them in kiosk mode so that the, you know, the, the students aren't in control of them, we're in control of them for testing. Um, but the fact that every single student has a device now, we don't now need to take the devices and give them out by grade. Every student can do them, we can test on the same day. And so our infrastructure has withheld that. So we're very excited about that possibility for next year as well. Schools are looking at individual uh, areas of improvement. Obviously, um, they are identifying their lowest performing students and providing assistance and intervention. So identifying that lowest 25%, figuring out who those students are, and making uh, adjustments to make sure that they hit their targets and their goals. And um, certainly, that continued focus on curriculum instruction assessments. And you know, just always teaching for understanding, teaching to the standards. We, we always say here, as long as we're following the curriculum and teaching to the standards, things like assessments, as was said earlier, will take care of themselves, really. If we're doing the things right every day in the classroom, the standardized test should be able to measure that. And it's, it's always been that, you know, and there is always pressure around teachers and students about this and about schools. Um, but really, it's about us measuring our own curriculum. We should see the time, the money, the dollars, the effort, the professional development that we're investing into the curriculum and the instruction is paying off. And that's, that's where MCAS data is very valuable to us to see whether that's paying off. So, you know, I, I think, you know, our science uh, program, for example, reaches out to us. They're very happy um, to see that we are, we are in the top. Out of the top five, there's, there's at least uh, two other districts using that program. So, for example, they're very proud of, of our achievement, and so we've done a press release with them because we think um, you know, that support, you know, it's our great teachers that are, that are implementing these programs, but we think that's, it's helpful information for us as well. Um, and so those are the things that we look at. So 
lots of areas of, of um, success, but also we've identified our areas of improvement at every school. John and I meet with the principals. We talk about those areas of improvement. The teachers have met with each teacher um, at grade level, and they talk about their, their different approaches for improvement as well. Any questions? I'm always interested in, um, especially at the high school level, how that works, that last thing you were saying. Um, it's a little easier for me to sort of comprehend it at the elementary school because you're you've got the, the the same student and you're following them through, whereas at high school it's just that grade ten test. Yeah. Uh, how do you sort of make the connections between how w one person didn't in their test in grade ten and and how that impacts the next people coming up? Yeah, high school is a little bit tricky, and I I for one personally I, I advocate for a different system. Um, because right now the grade 10 is not compared to themselves. They're compared, grade 10 is compared to grade 10, um, even for determining the lowest 25%. And so it's because they don't test in grade nine. So, um, and, and I get in a lot of districts it's complicated because and even in this district, some students don't go from grade eight to grade 10. But I, I personally, I'd rather see something with using a two year gap but with the same students to see their own growth as opposed to this year's cohort <coughs> growth against last year's. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's pretty complicated at grade 10. Um, but the bottom line is, and this is what we all embrace is, no matter who those lowest 25% are, we wanna see all of those students improve. So year to year, grade to grade, you look at those students, you wanna see them improve, and you wanna make sure that this year's uh, students can improve at a higher rate than in years past. It's this continuous improvement kind of cycle. Um, so, but that's always a discussion that we have, saying you know it's not even the same kids that we're comparing here, but, um, but that's a piece of it. So, you know, individually, the, the, the teachers and the department areas look at the, the assessments. They look at the questions. There are items that are shared. We look at ways to improve. We look at our writing. We look at um, testing across the board, different structures that we can use. And so there's just a lot of time spent on, you know, even, even in other subject areas, writing across the curriculum, reading across the curriculum. I think those uh, are all areas of improvement that we, that we work on in our departments. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Dr. Daly, you'd mentioned that uh, because of the good situation we're in with the comfort with technology and the, the students have their own Chromebooks now, um, how likely do you think it is that the spring we would be able to condense the number of MCAS testing days because of more efficient testing? Yeah, I'm, I'm fairly uh, confident that, that we will be able to do it. I mean, there's always, there's, there's, I always talk about the dual, the duality of infrastructure. There's the, the devices in the ceilings and there's also the, uh, the personnel, you know, because you do need tech support that's available. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say every single building in the district is going to all do it in the same day, you know, because we need it. We need that support. But last year we were able to do two out of three grades at the middle school the same day, and there, there is some talk of maybe doing more than that. So at least for some of the days. So I think there's a lot of potential. Uh, you know, Mr. Maloney and Ms. O'Connell have worked on that, um, and that that's there's just a lot of potential there because it's mm -hmm. it's you know even if you can cut out you know, one or two days of it being disruptive to the rest of the building. Um, because e even, you know, those are days when schedules are altered, you know, you don't want to have a lot of people using technology because we're using it for the testing, things like that. So I think the more that we can do that, the better. So that's something we're certainly optimistic about this year. So we'll, we can uh, certainly provide you updates on that as that moves along too, so. Sure, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Any other comments? <coughs> Mr. Chairman? Yes. Just in tune for all the committee and for the community, I, I want to thank, first of all, Patrick for his, his presentation that uh, he did tonight. And he, it has been his annual presentation to kind of take um, an awful lot of information <clears throat> that's made available to us and to really boil it down to, you know, what are the salient points that we think the community needs to be made aware of. And he's done a nice job with that historically and again tonight. But I also do want to um, just acknowledge that um, as a district, there is an awful lot to be proud of here. And, and while <clears throat> we always temper our, 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 our thoughts about testing and our student performance with respect to testing, um, because things can change, they can change year to year, but we have had a pretty consistent track record here in North Reading um, of, 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 of high academic performance on the part of our students. And I think I want to just publicly acknowledge that the, um, the effort that people put forth, um, teachers, support staff, the students themselves, the cooperation that we, that we receive from, from the home, from parents working with their children and their, um, and they're really 
stressing that, um, that, the, that the child's primary purpose is to come to school and learn and be prepared when they come here, um, and our administration, um, all are to be commended for, um, for another outstanding um, year of performance with respect to the MCAS. As, as Patrick mentioned, um, just next week, on, on Wednesday, mm. he and, and Christine Molly, the principal of the little school, and I are flying down to, um, to Washington, D.C., to, um, on behalf of the district, to receive the, the Blue Ribbon School Award. And while that is, um, you know, significant in and of itself, um, I think it, as I've said before, I think it speaks to a lot more than just about um, acad the academic performance of that school. I think it really is a, a feather in the cap for the entire community. And, one that we plan to um, to celebrate widely um, come January. I'm going to speak to that a little bit further in my superintendent's report, but um, it's just it's it's something to be extremely proud of. Um, another good year um, with respect to our um, MCAS performance data. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I won't repeat all of that, but I'll just say that <laughs> I, I will just say that you know, regardless of your feelings on testing, if you're going to have testing, it's good to do well in what you are being tested on and, and you know and I think it's very challenging when you have to go from a 98 to a 99 but I do think it's good that we focus on you know where there is room to improve still and we always try to focus on the kids that might be struggling the most and it's always good to be acknowledged for the hard work that people are doing and so thank you Dr. Daly thank you all the teachers and administrators and that's it okay and we don't need to vote on this so thank you very much and thank you Next on the agenda is Dr. Daly. Yeah. <coughs> is there a PowerPoint for this, or uh, should we go back to our seats? More of a graphic. You can go to your seat. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So thank you so much. I just, I asked uh, Mr. Bernard if I could just present for a few moments um, as superintendent, I'll say superintendent elect. <laughs> I don't know if it's the right term, but just to, to address you in that way, um, just for a moment, just to provide you as an update. It's been, it's been great since I was um, selected and I, I really enjoyed the time here in the transition with with mr. Berta. we've been meeting regularly um, weekly appointments that uh, that we we set aside time at least an hour where we talk about uh, nothing except the transition so sort of some of the other topical events that we talk about from day to day um, and and I, I really want to thank uh, mr. Bernard for that time and that that guidance and leadership what I'm presenting to you here um, because I've also since July because of the early appointment another another advantage was I was able to join the new superintendent's induction program cohort along with others that that uh, started in July and so I've been working with them being up to speed with all of the things that a new superintendent would need I'll be a little bit different because I'm not quite in the role yet. So we've, you know, modified some of my uh, goals there. But what what this is, and, I, and I've printed it out here because what I'm trying to do is sort of have a graphic to represent the transition and to represent the plan. So, um, and I made a, a copy for you here. It's a lot to take in, but essentially, what I'm sharing is the the idea of our strategic plan, which will continue. Um, it's the NRPS six, uh, 2016, NRPS 2021. What I'm starting to talk about here is a little bit of branding, and that's why I've done it in this way with this graphic. Um, but the, it's the concept of NRPS 2025, which to clarify is it, it would be a five-year plan, but it would start again fresh this year. So sort of the last year of 2021, it's, a, it's, it's a, a time for us to revisit this summer. You know, it's been 10 years since we've really gone back to the drawing board and looked at this as a, as a five-year vision. Um, and so that's the idea that we're going to start to work with there. So just as an update is what I've been doing this fall. Um, I've been doing some listening uh, tours and, and going to the different schools, talking to different folks, partly as assistant superintendent, hearing things there. But people I have noticed do, do speak to you a little differently, and they'll, they'll, they'll ask you questions about the future or some things there. So I've been doing some listening. Certainly what I will continue to do as we move into uh, when I do take that role. Um, 
So I, I would not, uh, you know, in January when I come in, I would not have an entry plan ready. I would still do an entry plan and do all those pieces once I'm fully in the role and, and have that ready. But the idea is that through the spring, I will continue to gather data and have analysis and sharing ready that I would present uh, the entry plan, similar to, to Mr. Bernard did, you know, uh, when he began. But I would do that towards the end of leading into the summer. And what that gives me is sort of a fresh start then to take some of that information that I've gathered from that piece and really get into a goal setting process with the administrators at the retreat this summer. And to begin to work on that new information that I've gathered and to share that out there. And then the idea would be that um, beginning in the fall and then ongoing from there, we would be getting uh, some of the new plans. So it's, it's the idea that we have an ongoing strategic plan and it's worked well and we're not going to abandon all those pieces. But I do think with the change in leadership, um, it is the right time to revisit some of these structures that are in place and, and to talk about whether what's working, what needs to, to change and improve. And that is a part of my entry plan and that is a part of um, the strategy that we're going to enact here in our NRPS 2025. As far as evaluation in those pieces, I think we would talk about that when I'm in the role, but the idea um, that I've worked out through the superintendent's induction program, there is some new evaluative tools that are out there, and I, you may have seen there's some discussion around that. I think that would be something we can certainly talk about in January. Um, but my goals that I would be proposing, a lot of the goals that are recommended are around being a part of the new superintendent's induction program, working on your entry plan, and doing some of those things as a new superintendent. So I feel like, in this time, from, from June until January, I've been doing some of that preliminary work that will help me strengthen those goals that would be my goals that I would provide evidence for next spring You know, at that time as well. So I don't know if anyone had any questions, but I just wanted to check in with you. So thank you. Yeah. Comments, questions? No, this is awesome. Yeah, it's great. Everyone's you know, in the back of their mind thinking, how is it going to happen? You know, So this yeah. is very helpful for you. <laughs> And then what, the one advantage you have is only Janine remembers the last transition. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. And thank you, Mr. Bernard, for helping with that as well. It's, it's been my pleasure. On both ends. Thank you. To, uh, it's been great. It's been a have great, a smooth transition. great transition. Great transition. It, it has been. Perfect. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Okay. <clears throat> we have no continuing business, so we'll move on to school committee policies. So policy in, subcommittee like the report so in the uh, uh, <coughs> in the service of efficiency I'll open with the motions and then we can discuss sounds great uh, mr. chairman I move that the committee uh, accept uh, the first reading for policy G B a B staff recognition I want a second, Chris, you want a second? Uh, yeah sure as a <laughs> member of the okay. committee I will second <laughs> and discussion <coughs> So um, this policy, uh, Mr. Bernard point, brought this to our attention as a policy that had some things in it that weren't current practice. And uh, so we basically uh, uh, adjusted the policy to meet current practice, specifically <coughs> in that um, the original policy mentioned, uh, I believe, a 10-year uh, service award that was not uh, being given out. Is that right? You want that, to? That, that is correct. Yeah, and I, I don't know that it. I mean, it's, I don't know that it was ever the practice, or at least not in recent memory. Um, and so it's kind of been, there have been a few policies that, um, that the three of us have discussed where, you know, let's align them, or at yep. least propose aligning them to what the current practice is, and this yep. is one. We do certainly award um, staff that reach the 25-year milestone with a, with a formal presentation on opening day, but um, the 10-year certificate has not been, has not been something, I've been here 17 years and it hasn't, it's never occurred, so we just thought that aligning it to what is done made sense. Okay. Anybody have any comments on the changes? I had done. Okay. So, and if no more discussion, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, sure. So, uh, Do you with have a motion on this one too. Y yes, uh, I move that the school committee uh, accept as a first read the athletic policy IDFA. Second. Okay, and discussion. Uh, so here, really, the only changes are in the uh, latter part, and you can see the, um, it's been some time since this was changed to reflect the new facility now, trying to uh, 
tighten up the language so that the the shared spaces all travel through the uh, independent principals and the athletic director for figuring out who gets what when. Made sense to me. Yeah. Any other comments? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I'll take the next one. I move that the uh, committee uh, accept as a first reading policy IDFAC, Financial Management of Athletic Program. Uh, a second. Excuse me. <laughs> um, and I believe we just added in the uh, 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 sort of a second person uh, to be on this list of uh, to, to uh, approve um, um, expenditures excess of, of in the bu yeah, <coughs> budget to include the assistant superintendent of finance and operations. Any comments? And my only question was if we didn't have that role in the future, but we do now, and we can, we can deal with that. Uh, we'll mend it later if we ever do. Don't. There you go. So. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Uh, make a motion mm -hmm. for the schools committee to accept as a first read minimum class size policy IECA. Second. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, here, this is, again, just keeping it into current practice and really what, what seems to make the most sense. Um, the idea that if uh, there is a class that uh, a, a school wants to run under the minimum of 15 students, that that matter shouldn't need to be brought to the school committee. It hasn't been our practice recently to do that and just seemed more in keeping with let the principals determine for themselves whether or not it's a, it's a, a fair class to run. Any comments? My only my only concern at all was I know that like my daughter happens to be in a class where there's like 28 kids, and so there's two classes of 14, and so if this runs into you know conflicting with our goals of trying to keep class sizes small at the elementary, but I think there's enough language in there to allow discretion on those yeah, things. Yeah, 28 would be over the limit that they like. Correct, but it's under 15 is the point. So. Right. And, but that's the, that's the whole point of the policy. Is it, it gives right. discretion right. in the first place. <laughs> it's just, yeah. If anything, it enables that more. Yeah, without right. having to. Removing uh, restrictions to yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm fine with not coming to the school committee. It's just the overall yeah. policy mm -hmm. at all. But that's right. is this more for like high school? Like they, I, There has to be enough interest in classes to that's offer That's right. Them? And you have to be able to balance it in the master schedule, too. But you know, it's not yeah. inconceivable that an advanced placement class <laughs> might run with fewer than 15 or yeah. a course for students with um, disabilities, <coughs> something like that. I mean, I would assume it happens fairly. It, I, it, I, can, I can speak to it happens, yes. I yeah. Mean, yeah. And often in the short term, it's, it's, it's a good strategy to have small classes. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So. OK. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. <coughs> OK, next we have <coughs> to appoint some members to contract negotiation. Do you want me to speak to this? Ne negotiations. Yeah, Mr. Bernard, do you want to speak quickly? Sure. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. So <coughs> yes, we have, um, as my notes in my report to you say, um, there are three collective bargaining agreements um, that are going to expire on June 30th. So in the spirit of trying to um, at least facilitate that process a little bit early on than, earlier on than we might typically do because of my upcoming retirement and to try to work with Dr. Daly a little bit in the transition period to, to, to you know, familiarize him with processes and such and get some dates on the calendar. I'm looking to start things a little bit earlier. Um, probably, you know, this month, I'd like to at least convene an initial meeting and then maybe have a second meeting in December and establish meeting dates with those three collective bargaining groups um, for, the, for the remainder of the, of the spring and in, in, in leading up to um, their expiration on June 30th. So what has happened in the past in, and what I'm asking for um, this evening is that the five of you decide um, on uh, one representative to, to work with the administration and the representatives of the various collective bargaining agreements. Each, each committee would have one um, representative of the school committee. So I'm asking for you to um, kind of appoint one of you to work with us on the negotiations with the custodians, somebody to work with us on the negotiations with the paraprofessionals, and then someone to work with us on the um, negotiations for the secretaries. Excellent. Thank you. And, and the only thing I will add is the contract subcommittee has in the past done um, some work, a spreadsheet, to try to compare all the different contracts it's a little bit out of date um, I will volunteer when people remind me to try to update that with the most recent
contracts just so that everybody can see it so that when we are going to negotiate that we all at least have the same information. <clears throat> so there's three different contracts that we need to or we need a representative for the custodians, the paraprofessionals and the secretary. So why don't we begin with the custodians and if anybody wants to volunteer and I will throw my hat in to volunteer for the negotiation of the custodians contract. Okay. If there's any other works for me. Okay. Then if, I think you should vote it. Well, yeah, I, I will vote it. So, I mean, then, so I will, well, does it, I guess I'll move that I. <laughs> I think so, Mrs. Well, Mrs. 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 Embryon, Mrs. Embryon is ready to move. So there you go. Uh, if you uh, make the nominee. I'll make a motion to appoint Scott the um, representative to this, uh, the custodian's contract negotiations. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Okay, paraprofessionals. Anybody interested in helping with that contract? I'd be happy to take that on. Okay. I'll make a motion to uh, have Rich be the paraprofessional collective bargaining negotiator. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. And for the secretary, is anybody volunteer for that? Oh, I'll throw my hat in the ring. <coughs> I make a motion to appoint Janine as the uh, negotiator for the secretarial contract negotiations. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you. We didn't Thank you, everyone. We didn't advance at all. No. <laughs> we just I'll agree work, so start, easily. I'll start reaching out to the three of you and start trying to get a, a date on the calendar. For I'm the sorry. I'm, I'm really booked up, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. The next one, the academic calendar. Mr. Bernard, would you like to speak about this? I would, Mr. Buckley, thank you, and for all of you. So it's, it's that time of year, believe it or not, where we, we start to bring forward the, um, the, the, the draft of the calendar for the next school year. So what I have in your packet um, is a, um, a draft of the academic calendar for the 2020-2021 school year. Um, it's not all that out of, out of the ordinary, with the one exception being that um, I'm proposing that, um, that, that schools start before Labor Day um, in September, which is not something that has traditionally happened here in North Reading. Um, but be given, given that Labor Day is very late um, next year, it's, in, it's, it's uh, September 7th, Monday, September 7th. So what I'm proposing is that, um, that we bring the um, staff back for the traditional orientation day on, on September 1st, and then our students would come to school on um, the second and third, a Wednesday and a Thursday and that we would have um, a no school day um, in, in recognition of the Labor Day weekend on Friday, September 4th, and then the holiday would be observed on September 7th. That, that schedule, uh, it, the, the lateness of Labor Day is, is, is um, a factor, of course, but that schedule of the observance of the Friday before is something that has been typically done um, in school districts that do start before Labor Day. And I would just add that, um, and certainly, you know, Dr. Daly will be able to bring this forward for you in the future but I don't think that I don't think the spirit of this is to do this f going forward every year I think we're looking to do that only because of the the lateness of the um, of the Labor Day holiday and then I look at the end of the school year and I get a little concerned um, about <clears throat> um, where we are and we can't go to school beyond June 30th so if, if we were to factor in if we had a bad winter or other reasons that school had to be canceled and we had to advance that last day there's not a lot of wiggle room before we get to you would be up to June 28th otherwise, so you, there's not a lot of room if you don't. We ran into that problem once once before, maybe three years ago, where I had had drafted a memo to go to school on two Saturdays because we were getting close to, to June 30th. You never had to do it. That was the 15th. Yeah, the 15th mm -hmm. uh, winter. I think it was 15, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think it was my first year as superintendent. So that that is a significant difference, but it is, it is I think, really, other than that, it's really the calendar, I think, is pretty um, is pretty standard. I will I will tell you, too, that the, the teacher's collective bargaining agreement has a provision in it that I consult with them, and I think that is the exact word that I consult with them on, on the calendar, and I did do that before I brought it forward tonight, so the, the teacher's union is on board with what you see here as well, just for your information. Thank you. So I have some concerns, but I wanted to open it up to other people first to see if anybody else has comments or concerns. I mean, in general, I... <coughs> thrilled that North Reading still starts school after Labor Day. It's 
my own personal opinion, although there's, I'm sure there's good arguments for doing it other ways in, in other districts. But this, I mean, I'll be interested to hear what you say, Scott, but it, <coughs> it makes sense given the pressure that the late, you know, the, the late Labor Day uh, puts on it on the end of the year. It, it makes sense to me, but. I mean, well, I, I mean, my comments are, I mean, I, I'm, I'm opposed to beginning before Labor Day. Um, I, would act, I would vote against this for that reason. Um, I think the proposal has us ending on the same day as it is this year, and I think it could just be pushed back a couple of days. I do think that when you look back, I, I, I reached out to the oldest person that I know in North Reading, Mr. Venezia, and asked him uh, <laughs> if he can ever remember us speak, uh, beginning before Labor Day, and he said since 1986 or whatever that he, he can't remember us ever beginning before Labor Day. I've, I've actually asked a few other people, and uh, you know, Labor Day has fallen on the seventh before, just uh, a few I years ago. Ask about <coughs> what we've done in the past in, yeah. in that situation. But. Yeah, I mean, a few a few years ago when this building opened, I know that, you know, we we you know we bought ourselves an extra week by opening after Labor Day, and I understand the intention, and nobody really wants to be going into schools at the very end of June, but at the same time, I think even if we pushed it back a couple of days, or a professional development day was moved up or eliminated or you know changed a little bit, I. I think that, you know, yeah, there was one year that I think we had six, you know, snow days, but even if you moved it to the 28th and as the last day, that still gives you, you know, seven snow days that you can have. Plus the two. Yeah. And for me, I think there's a lot of families that, you know, rent homes that rent them the same week every year and some of them do it for Labor Day weekend. And I just think it would be a very, a big inconvenience too. To the public, I do know there was already a discussion a couple weeks ago or a week ago on the North Reading Community Connection where somebody just asked if, if they knew yet, and a lot of people kind of chimed in and were talking about vacations being booked and the exact thing that I just brought up where you know people have the same week that they're going away. And so I, I understand the, the idea of doing it. I completely understand there's a lot of schools that begin before Labor Day, but I would personally be opposed to North Reading moving that. I just think that it's... And I understand it'd only be once every, whether whatever it's five years or six years or seven years that we do it. But I would rather have one year where you know we have seven days potentially before we have a Saturday, um, or even rework it slightly more if there's a professional development day earlier or something. But that that's my feelings on it. I mean, obviously I'm only one of of five people here, but that's where I fall on this. So um, I. <clears throat> I would be curious, I, I follow the logic of, of, the, of the proposal, but I'm curious what percentage of years or how likely it is that, uh, based on historical data, that we'd have in excess of seven snow days? I, I don't and, know. And I, not, I don't believe it's happened since I've been here. Anecdotally, I, going yeah. back to my years in school up through my years yeah. in the workforce, I, I can't recall. So, you know, viewing that, as Scott's saying, where as it stands, if we started on the 8th, the day after Labor Day, that the schedule would have seven days of leeway, of snow days before running it into would. that worst case scenario of having to really make a dramatic choice or change. Uh, and looking at that as a very outside the realm of likelihood chance of happening based on how things, things tend to have gone historically, um, then, then yeah, I would agree that there, there seems to be a balance of, of a, a shift in change, a shift in philosophy, and a shift to people's plans and expectations. Um, obviously, it's not easy when you need to make decisions on the go or on the fly, um, but there, there, there are also a couple of, of PD days planned throughout the year, and if the concern is such that it seems imprudent to allow only seven days, then potentially maybe they could be moved up in advance of Labor Day as, you, you know, as, as teachers maybe are getting geared up to go. I'm not sure you know, what the agenda is for them, but... Yeah, we did have, we on had paper. one year, we did have a year where we started before Labor Day. For um, teachers or for students? For teachers. Yes. Yeah, within, within my five years as superintendent, we had a professional development day for a new math curriculum we were rolling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I don't, and I, your point is well taken on the snow days. I don't want that to be the only, I, I think, I think I have an obligation to propose what I think is educationally sound. Mm -hmm. And I think this is an educationally sound decision, much like it was to not do it when a similar situation arose when we were opening this school. But if the committee sees otherwise, but I think, you know, I just, I want to, I want to emphasize that the administrative council and the teachers support this change. You know, I'm just offering that to you, and I think that that's a, not a point to be lost. But sure, it's, and it's, I, I'd like I bring to it to, to you for your your blessing. And if you yeah. prefer to do something else, that's fine. And I'd just like to follow up on that. So if because uh, I, I think, uh, and I can't speak for Scott here, but I honed in on the idea of snow days and, yeah. and that thought. 
Um, so if that completely aside, if uh, you think it's, as you're saying, if it's academically sound, um, why? Where's, where's the... I think we lose. There? I think we lose a lot of time when kids could be in classes learning. Mm -hmm. That when we are subject to testing, um, <laughs> that we are behind a little bit. And I think when we when the lateness of the year, mm -hmm. I think that only further exacerbates that problem. Kind of the, the attitude in late June is yeah. a little bit harder to or, kind of or, or, you know, state standardized testing or retests that take place as early as November, you know, those kinds of things. And I just, I think the school, at that late date, if this was, if it was an August 31st, I would feel differently, but I think it's September, it's still September, and I thought, okay, let's, let's see if there's a, an appetite for changing mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And I think we're giving, you know, a 10-month notice as well. So. But, but I, I think to the point of, and again, just thinking about the community reaction, it's mm -hmm. definitely true that, you know, there will be people, uh, probably not an insignificant number, who have regular plans and on that same week. All sure. The time. Yeah, that, that may be true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I think it's the it's not just the community perception because of vacations it's also like just like the first reaction you said it's that there's so many people that are so thankful that our school district still starts after Labor Day um, as a parent of a child in the schools I am so grateful that that's the case and I never want that to change and I feel like that parental perspective of having kids in the school there's probably many people that feel the same way even, so I realize even it's aside from vacation. Yeah. yeah, regardless. I mean that I hear it. Yeah. I hear that, but yeah. I do think that there would be a little bit of a there would be some comments for sure. I think that would come in the direction, especially, you know, this just the perception of it and the shifting of it and what that means and fear <coughs> of that happening every year, regardless if it's being discussed and stated that way today. Um I just think it would be perceived negative. So I'm, I'm hearing there's a consensus to keep things kind of as they have been with the Tuesday teacher day after Labor Day and then students on Wednesday. Um, I, I'd, I'll add one more point just to, just to that thought because sure. I'm still not exactly sure where I, where I, I, I settle on this. I, I agree that I'd expect a reaction from people, but I think that that's natural to any kind of change, just as a generality. Um, I, I know that I would... Uh, be interested in hearing more just specifics any data or just any any more specific arguments about the the academic merits to changing it to, to how we could see that that kind of helping and, and I think on that grounds I'd, I'd be interested but um, but at the at the moment I, I, I don't feel I have enough information to, to, to kind of come down on that side the, of it. The, on, the only other point that I would raise is I had somebody when that discussion was happening on the community connection I had somebody reach out to me and say that they are a teacher that starts before, and she, she said those days she's found in her school were just completely unproductive because they're there for two days, then they go away for four days, and then they come back, and she said they're, they've basically been throw, throwaway days in her opinion, you know, um, when they were just there for a day or two before On, on holiday, that note, so. a lot of districts, <laughs> and uh, as, as SELs kind of come more to the forefront of, of teaching in, in, in schools and kind of been added to a lot of teachers' vocabulary, uh, there's a push to spend the first couple of days working more on the social emotional learning aspect of the school year as opposed to diving right into curriculum. I don't know that having two days as a mini week before the school year started in earnest would necessarily, I think that t trends might actually mitigate some of that loss that you're talking about just in how classrooms are, are opening up these days. But with that being said, then we're kind of dictating, I mean, the curriculum change and I don't Really well, sure. I, that's I, not, that's I certainly not, that's don't want to insist upon that, that one. So. Just seeing that happen anecdotally more in my peers. Yeah. So I mean, so I, I personally would not would be in favor of having the first day for the students reporting. If if there is an administrative day before or there's a professional dev development day before, that's fine. But if there was, I would be in favor of the first day of the students being there being after Labor Day, and so I would not be in favor of this calendar for that reason. And I don't know what other people's thoughts are, but uh, I would agree with that and and underline that uh, at the moment and underline that having the students start on the Tuesday doesn't shift things back so much. But yeah, I mean, as a potential, I, mean, I wouldn't yeah. see a need to do that. Oh, okay. Okay. I think we could 
Okay. If we're gonna, if yeah. we're not gonna do this, yeah. then I would just keep it. Right? Yeah. I don't. There's not a need to have that okay. ED day before Labor Day. And do we have a third that are in that? I am in that camp. camp. Um, okay. Although it may be diminished, the reaction of the community. I feel like we have to represent the community as well. And when a change it takes place that isn't very clear on the value of that change, I think that that <clears throat> that should be looked at because it. I just don't see the full justification on why. So um, I would be voting against the calendar. So reason. would you would you want to do you want to see another draft at the next meeting, or do you just want to approve it with September 8th being the teacher, you know, as it normally would be if we didn't do this? So then, so just to be clear, then, so the it would be September. Each day would be the eighth, the first day of. So instead of nine one, it would be nine, nine eight. eight, and then nine two becomes nine nine. Nine nine, and then nine two and nine three become. 9, 10, nine, and 9, nine 11. Just, now it just goes, right. 9, 10, and 9, 11. Mm -hmm. And then the last day with five school, with five snow days. You go to the 29. 29. Mm -hmm. <coughs> just for that, yeah. Would we entertain that? Do you want to talk about that with the administrative <coughs> council? That might be worth discussing. Okay. At least bring the Okay. So why don't yeah. why don't I, bring, I just table that for now? I'll, I was going to say may, we may not be able to meet with them before the 18th. So why don't we do it? It may be December 9th that I sure. bring it to you. Okay, that's fine. great. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So then we won't have a motion on this right now. Yeah, you can just you we'll can just, just move on. Throw it away. Okay. Table it. Yep. <laughs> I appreciate it. <clears throat> and and I I would just say I mean I, we look to you to set the curriculum then. Never like to be on the opposite side of the superintendent, but I also just you know want to make sure I express my thoughts when I have them. So <laughs> don't worry, I don't have them that often. So you don't. On the contrary. Oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. I missed that. Moving one. on. <laughs> <laughs> the minutes. Sorry, are you scared? Okay. We have the minutes for the executive session first. If someone would like to make some motions on these. I'll make a motion to accept. The executive session minutes of September 9, as written. A second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I'll mm -hmm. make a motion to accept the open session regular minutes of September 9, as written. A second. <coughs> Any discussion? Any changes? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I will make a motion to accept the open session town meeting minutes of October 7th as written. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Unanimous. Thank you. Um, did you do the executive session that you asked me for the notes on? Yes, that was the that was, that was the first one, right? Yeah, that was the first yeah. one, right? Yeah, okay. Um, okay. Budget update and... We need. A, we have a couple of motions at the end of this. Correct. Correct. Yes, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> so this evening is the um, we have a first fiscal tw uh, 2020 budget report, um, which essentially reflects financial activity through the first quarter of the fiscal year, which would be activity through September 30th of 2019. And uh, the report, as has been our practice, is broken into um, expenses and payroll activity. And I'm happy to report that I do think the first quarter of the fiscal year has gone fairly well and we are in solid financial standing. Uh, there has been, and as we've discussed in the past, um, a couple of kind of unforeseen maintenance items that occurred very early on in the, in the fiscal year, in the in July and August months. Uh, specifically, we had to re address uh, the replacement of three membranes at the wastewater treatment plant as well as replacement of the little elementary school main fire panel. So these are two costs that were unanticipated. Um, and fortunately, given that the extraordinary maintenance line item was restored with the adoption of the fiscal 2020 budget, um, that certainly helped us uh, address these areas without any uh, you know, significant budget uh, concern. Uh, but given that this uh, extraordinary maintenance line item has essentially been spent, um, it's going to be important that we monitor all expenses, but it, um, essentially uh, you know, the building and maintenance areas closely as we move through the fiscal year. 
as it is true that we do have a lessened ability to, to address um, you know, the unforeseen costs um, at this point. Um, in supplies and so forth start the school year, as has been the case in the past. We're certainly ordered and received over you know, July and August. We've encumbered all of our utility expenses, as we typically do when we monitor the electricity and the heating and, and gas consumption and, and costs as we move through the fiscal year. Um, some positive news again in the food service program, as we, we talk about monthly, uh, they close out the month of September with a small net profit of a little over $2,700. Uh, this was slightly better than forecasted and I think is an encouraging sign for the program as we start the new school year. The program typically does experience a loss in the month of September with higher food labor and production <coughs> startup costs. Um, average meals sold per day and particularly at the bachelor school and middle school and high school were up by over 15 percent <coughs> when compared to last September. So some, some positive <coughs> trends kind of out of the gates with food service in the month of September. Mr. Connell, can I ask a couple questions on that really quick while you're sure. talking about it? Sure, yeah. So number one, was the price increase implemented for September? It was, okay. yeah. And, and where are they, are they doing breakfast at all the schools now? Or? Breakfast is at all the schools. Okay. Yep. So there's a breakfast option at all the schools. Um, you know, I think that program continues to do well. The middle school and the high school where it's sort of established is, is seeing in the bachelor school, which had it last year, th those sales were higher. Um, the hood and the little is slow, but that, that was the case at the bachelor elementary school last year, so we, we hope that will pick up. Um, but I don't see any, any really impact um, you, you know, by the price increase in terms of participation. I think the you know, elasticity of, of uh, you know, parents was pretty, was pretty minor, and um, you know, so I think that's hopefully that's a, a positive sign. Um, on the payroll side, the district once again experienced you know, somewhat of a busy summer filling, filling staff vacancies. The district, you know, from time to time, will certainly have a need to hire long-term substitutes to fill extended leave of absences this school year. But as of right now, based on the information known um, to us at this point in time, although, you know, certainly this, this is very uh, variable and, and changes often, very fluid, we certainly don't see this, that the, this will impact the short and long-term substitute budget. Um, the district uh, has yet to fill two central office support positions this fiscal year. Um, we have instead been able to leverage existing staff roles and responsibilities to fill this need. Um, these positions were part of the business office with the accounting and receptionist role as well as in the data and technology office with the data coordinator position. So as a result, the, you may notice on the report, there's available balances in these two line items. Um, so the administration is certainly in the process of evaluating the long-term solution to fill the needs in these areas, but we feel in the short term we've been able to make do with expanding roles and responsibilities of some of our existing staff. Most other payroll projections at this time indicate that they will be within the budgeted line items. Um, as we enter the start of the second quarter of the fiscal year, I do believe we are in solid financial standing. Um, as, we, as, we move, as we move forward and we'll just continue to, to watch any unforeseen costs as they arise. Um, there is a supplemental report regarding student activities, but before I move on to that, are there any questions on the, the financial update um, at this point in time? No, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so as has been our practice, um, and as, as part of the new student activity, uh, guidelines that were adopted a few years ago. They also don't actually feel too much new anymore, but as part of our, our uh, newly adopted school committee policy and, and, and procedure manual, um, we do present uh, quarterly data to the, the full school committee. Um, so it's that time of year where, where, where this report reflects student activity, activity through the first quarter of the fiscal year, which again is July through September. So enclosed in the report is your certified reconciled quarterly account balances um, for each of the five student activity accounts, which is the five, the five schools. Also has been our practice with the middle school and the high school who actually have a variety of sub-accounts. Um, those sub-account balances are also reflected um, in, in the report as well. Um, we are required annually to have the, the school committee sort of endorse the, uh, the current active um, activities and list of cl uh, clubs at the middle school and the high school. 
So as part of the first report of the school year for this, this evening, I am asking that the school committee also take a formal vote of approval <coughs> to adopt the, the active um, sub accounts at the high school and the middle school that are listed on, on the report and in the reflected memo. Um, in addition, as we uh, approach our, our audit, uh, which will occur later this, this year, um, I'm asking the committee to formally accept the provisions of Section 47 of Chapter 71 of the Massachusetts General Laws. This was a audit recommendation a, a couple of years ago when we were audited. Um, I felt like we did it, but I actually looked for the notes and the minutes on that. I could not find it. Mm -hmm. So this could be that I'm just asking you to do it again, but I don't, I don't think it would hurt for us to, to, to do that. Um, as I said in the memo, I believe this was already done, but I just, I don't, I'm asking the committee this evening to just readopt the provisions of this law, which was a recommended practice um, by our last audit. I have attached um, the Mass General Law um, to this packet for your reference, and I've included a recommended motion um, on page two of the memorandum as well. Um, so there's a, there's a couple motions reflected on the, the back page of the memorandum. In addition, it, it is also sort of recommended um, to for the school committee to can kind of annually vote um, maximum account balances and cash flow into the the the, the accounts for the 2019-20 school year. So I would I'm asking the committee to also uh, make this motion and, and vote as well, so we can document um, this for. Uh, any upcoming audit uh, audits uh, later later this year I think it's I think it's a good good practice for us to get in the habit of, of doing that the, the the maximum balances that are reflected I, I think certainly based on our uh, trends and our analysis over the last few years as we've certified our our quarterly balances and monthly balances on an ongoing basis I think these certainly are an appropriate level of account balances and I don't think we are, would be in danger of of falling out of compliance with, with any of these account balances at any point in time. Um, so you may ask, you know, in some cases, the high school, why, you know, why, where the account balance at the moment is $76,000, why do you need it to be 125000 And at times when, certainly around the times of senior prom, when that cash flow gets very high, is that collection of revenues to, to fund a, a, a uh, the senior prom, you know, we could rise above or close to that level for a brief period of time, and that, that would be the reason for that. Um, but these balances are very typical. I've done research in other, other uh, communities, and, and these are pretty typical balances at these, at these levels. Um, so there is two recommended motions, but before, I mean, before we get to that, I'll entertain any questions from what I've presented, presented to date. Uh, just one question. The uh, $222 for the 2019 class what happens when there's left over so it's a great question so our policy essentially allows for six months of um you know up to six months for that class to go and establish their reunion or their separate account mm -hmm. um and then they they would either you know donate a portion of those funds you know back to the district for a <laughs> class gift or we would make a once they've shown evidence, the class offices that an account's been established for their reunion account, mm -hmm. we would have them sign a, a memorandum and bring in the account, and we would make a, a check out for the deposit only um, to that check. So this, this always typically, gotcha. just because of the timing, it always happens over Thanksgiving break. Right. Because that's when they're home, and that's when they come in, and they show us the account, <clears throat> and that's, that's when that typically that check would be cut. So this is probably the, at the end of this month. Right. It would, it would no longer be there. I have two questions. Number one is the international club has a negative balance. Okay. They're allowed to. They're allowed to go in the negative. I mean, where does that funds come from? Will it be brought to zero soon? Or so. Yeah, I'm sure that's a, <clears throat> it's a. I'm sure it's a timing situation where we're probably waiting for a uh, deposit to post. Um, so there, there could be times where it's temporarily something may go into, to the negative. Um, but I, I, I'm very confident that's a timing situation where there's a deposit that has yet yet to post into that account and and the haunted playground do, do the funds from that go into the uh, the performing art the performing arts or whatever that is the revolving so account those masters? would go into maskers because that's a separate fundraiser that the club okay. is overseeing. So that goes into this one the that goes into this one okay correct and that, is that reflected in that 
total yet or not? Um, again, this is as of September 30th, so that would not be reflected. Okay. Right. Just wondering, the, was that? I hope that was a su successful. I think event. yeah. It was yes. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah. Okay. I know they. I want to say. I, I believe it was twelve thousand dollars. That's great. Quite honestly, that's great. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Jenny. Um, can you just update us on how the maskers money has been separated? You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Right. The whole <clears throat> so that that's gone fairly smooth. I think that's. Um, so again, gate receipts and um, ticket sales for the performing arts shows are being deposited into the performing arts revol revolving account. Sorry, the user fee, <laughs> user fee and the ticket sales revenue is being deposited into the. Um, Performing Arts Revolving Account, okay. and then any separate fundraiser that the Maskers Club, which still exists, that they're putting on to help fund a school trip. They have a Disney trip coming up, which is, was the point of a lot of the haunted uh, playground fundraisers they're doing. That's supporting any enrichment or extra, extra, the extras that the club does, mainly you know trips and performances. Um, so that's kind of the differentiation between the two. Yeah. The revenue flowing into the Performing Arts Account through the participation fee that was voted or through the ticket sale based on the performances, uh, essentially funds the, the, the cost for the stipends or advisors working <coughs> with those shows and sh costs directly related to put on those shows, which would be props, <coughs> costumes, et cetera. And, and that's, that's been working out. Okay. Well, actually, I don't think Ms. maybe Ms. Grew mentioned this, but the music band tickets went on sale today as well. It went today, yeah. So <coughs> if anyone wants to go. Music the Music Man, man that's tickets went on sale that's today. So yeah. I got my tickets first, earlier. The first two weeks in December? Yeah. Yes. First I, lo weekend. I love that they're doing a classic musical, too. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> I will say, I, I bought my tickets this afternoon, and the set, the first Saturday, like the whole middle section was pretty yeah, much sold out already. So. They'll, they'll sell out all four. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so we have two motions. If somebody would like to make the motions, we would like to do some reading. Sure, I'll move that the school committee vote to approve the list of active student activity accounts at the high school and middle school for the 2019-2020 school year as presented by the administration. Further, that the school committee vote to approve the following maximum account balances for the 2019-20 school year and beyond for the elementary accounts $10,000, for the middle school account $25,000, and for the high school accounts $125,000. I second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous? Thank you. And I will move that the school committee vote to accept the provision of Section 47 of Chapter 71 of the Massachusetts General Laws, which govern student activity accounts. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. <laughs> Any staffing? No staffing. How about the bids and donations? We do have those. Excellent. <clears throat> uh, I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of classroom percussion instruments from DonorsChoose.org to support Jana Como's music class at the Hood School. Second. And do we want to have the dollar amount or not? Uh, yes, the dollar amount of $386.12. Okay. Wasn't all the motion. All those in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $500 from Merrimack College to be used, used towards STEAM projects district wide. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. They want, their, they want their incoming students to be even, the best better, even better prepared. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $642 from North Reading Touchdown Club to be used towards replacement jerseys at the high school. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. <coughs> I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of dedicated funds from the J. Turner Hood Parents Association to be used towards the Generation Genius Program at the Hood School. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $1,000 from Salon 77 to be used at the principal's discretion for the students, staff, or building needs at the little school. Second. The only point of discussion I would have here is, is this somebody we might want to call in to recognize? Because I think it's great when local organizations run fundraisers specifically for the school. I don't know. 
I mean, I, the little school might have done something already to bring them in. I saw a big check when I was in there one time, but this was a nice thing that they did, but I don't know what was people it a think. Fundraiser or yeah, they did, they did a fundraiser. They did a fundraiser just to raise money for the schools. So. I bet they rounded it up. Yeah. So, I don't know. Maybe we could think about it later, but. They're deserving of recognition for sure. Yeah, certainly. Either way, we appreciate them doing well, we it. We can but find out if the <coughs> school did do anything. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And see. Yeah. Hey, I, I think it's great when the community for whatever run fundraisers for us. So, okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. And I move that the school committee vote to accept with gratitude a donation of $2,045 from the J. Tur Turner Hood Parents Association to be used towards five Chromebooks at the Hood School. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Unanimous. I have a quick question. Yes. What is the Generation Genius that. Program? <laughs> Generation Genius. <laughs> Mr. Bernard, I know what um, is. You know? Generation Junior. That was the one that came from the Hood School. Yeah, I do not often. I don't. I don't. I didn't know. I guess neither one of us was a member, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the answer. Well, it's better funded today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> so subcommittee updates. Norcam Board of Directors. I was there. We had a meeting. They talked finances. Uh, they talked um, when they should and shouldn't cover things, and uh, we adjourned. Yeah. We can yeah. Excellent. I feel like I'm policy there. subcommittee. Um, we went through the entirety of Section J, which pertains to students uh, making. Uh, a few minor changes, nothing, nothing of any extreme significance, but we'll be coming across them. Yeah, I think, the I think there was maybe, maybe one or two things that we'll bring forward. Yeah. I think there's two. Two, yeah. yeah. JIBB and JIBBR. That's exactly what I would have said. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was, um, it was but, and they were advisory committee. Yeah. But they were nothing uh, of even, incredible even, even those are just, change. No, just it was, yeah, it was minor adjustments. Again, I think it was more, what's the practice? Yeah, and we're optimistic that we'll make it through the, uh, the next few sections shortly. We're, we're being driven like a team of cattle to, or uh, horses Oxen. to. Uh, I think we'll make yeah. it. We're going to get there. Yeah, we should get you a whip. Okay. So. Generation Genius is, is uh, educational videos. I just Now, now that I'm okay. seeing it, I remember it was a series of videos. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember, I remember that, too, actually. Now, I do now. Now, now, that, now, that, now that I'm hearing it, I remember I'm that. Being reminded. Well. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, me, <laughs> too. More of those reminders. <laughs> okay. I also recognize Ms. Boutwell, even though she doesn't do the subcommittee report, she's had a lot of meetings this week that have been quite long, taking a lot of her time with CIPC and no, the uh, Master Planning Committee, so <laughs> thank you to you as well. Um, okay, subcommittee schedule, finance planning team, November 8th, 8.15 a.m. at Superintendent's Conference Room, Substance Use Coalition, November 19th at 10 a.m. at the North Reading Police Station. Fine Arts Subcommittee, November 20th at 2.30 p.m. in the Superintendent's Conference Room. NORCAM Board of Directors, November 21st, 7 p.m. NORCAM Office. Policy Subcommittee, November 25th, 3.45 p.m. at Superintendent's Conference Room. Athletic Subcommittee, December 11th, 12.30 p.m. at su the Superintendent's Conference Room. Um, Administrator, oh, yes. Before you go on, John, <coughs> I have it for some reason that the Athletic Subcommittee is on the 20th. Of it, November? it was. I, it, I, I sent an email last okay. week that okay. yeah, both the high school principal, athletic director, and I all have a conflict. Okay. It's the annual <clears throat> Rotary Club um, luncheon okay. for the football teams and cheerleaders and band, and, and it got scheduled for that same day. Okay. So Did I'm, you send a note in the mail to Janine? Uh, I have to try to do <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He sends emails. It's just whether I. Sorry. That's okay. okay. Move it. No, 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 don't move it. <laughs> you want to miss a meeting? Huh? I actually enjoy those meetings. <laughs> it's good, right? It's a good group. It's yeah. good, right? <laughs> okay. Administrative report. Mr. Chairman, I do, I do have a few things to share with you tonight. So, um, as I've done with you in the past, consistent uh, with my obligations of as the district's representative to the North Shore Consortium and the SEAM Collaborative, I've enclosed <laughs> a uh, recent um, ex report from the executive director of each of those um, institutions. We held a second STEAM night um, in the district on Tuesday, October 22nd. I, I, I know some of you were able to attend and send your good wishes, and I appreciate that. Um, it was a very good night. Um, I, want to, I want to publicly um, commend Dr. Downs, our Director of Digital Learning, um, for his leadership in coordinating that effort. This is, so this is just a reminder, is a recognition of um, Governor Baker's declaration of a STEM week um, across Massachusetts last year when 
when this first started, we, we expanded ours to a, a STEAM week, a STEAM uh, night. And uh, so we've, we've brought the arts in too. And I think we had um, increased presentations this year. We had a keynote speaker. We had increased um, participation on, on staff and students. And I thought it was a nice night for the community. And I'm, I'm appreciative for everybody that helped to, um, to make that successful. I thought that I thought the the game was fun in the beginning. Oh yeah, was it Kahoot? Was that oh, were you there? Were you there too? Yeah, you're there. Yeah. Finish finish number five. <laughs> I was actually making an effort to not finish in the uh, in the prize winning. Category. Oh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Bernard and I were sitting next to each other. We were, we, we were, we were trying to win the thing. So. <laughs> you were looking up a lot on your phone though. You were looking up a lot of hands. <laughs> I was asking you a lot. Uh, I didn't know it. So. It was cute. It was a nice night. It was good. It was fun. And again, just informational. We had, you know, so I, we had the, we hosted a, a speaker last Monday night. Um, this gentleman, J.W. Oker, he came and he did about a 45, 50 minute informational presentation about Edgar Allan Poe and kind of traced his travels through his short life in, along kind of the, the eastern seaboard, if you will, and into New England. And it was just, Dr. Daly was there. He was really interesting. And we had about, I don't know, 45 people maybe that came. And That's great. Ben. It was great. He had, we did it in this room. He had a nice PowerPoint. I, he sold, um, he brought some of his books at my request, and he did a little book signing after. And I'd say he sold maybe 12 to 15 books, but he was really good. It was very interesting. I had seen an ad in the Middlesex East flyer um, in, the, in the transcript that he was performing, or it's a, that's too strong, we're presenting in the Tewksbury Public Library. And so I reached out to him and he got back to me and yeah, it was, it was a nice, I think it was a nice little showcase for us. So it's just informational for you. Um, we'll be hosting a uh, school safety summit, a sa our second school safety summit this Thursday uh, in this room, the Distance Learning Lab, with the support of our uh, public safety <coughs> personnel and the police and fire department. You might remember back in uh, 2017, we hosted Screenagers. That was a film of kind of for parents and children about time on screen. Well, the sequel has recently been released, um, actually just in October. We're one of the first school districts that's going to be showing that, and that's gonna be happening on um, November 12th um, at 6.30 p.m. I attached for you an article of interest. Um, this was an article that, um, that appeared in the National um, Science Teachers Association periodical. So Mary Hatton is a, is a North Reading uh, resident and she's also a parent of, um, of students in our district and a, and a professor at Endicott College. And she has been working with the students and staff at the Batchelder School for some time. Well, this was an article that um, highlighted a project that she did with three teachers at the Batchelder School, Sarah Grimbliss, Caroline Keene, and Tara Kenyon. And I just, I, Mr. Colleen shared this with me, and I just thought it was so worthy of being shared with all of you um, about the, I, I loved the, the, the kindergarten, the kindergarten. So it's about, it's about gardening. I think, Mr. McGowan, you were in my office the day I got this, I think, yeah. right? And I shared it was kind of hot yeah. off the press then. And we just, I just think it was a really yep. well-written article on a very interesting uh, and cute project with, um, with kindergarten students at the at the bachelor school, so I thought you I thought you might get a kick out of seeing it, so I wanted to pass that along to you. Excellent. Um, and then lastly, and it was mentioned a little bit earlier, um, Dr. Daly and Mrs. Molly, the principal of the little school, and I will be going to um, Washington D.C. as representatives of the district to um, receive the the Blue Ribbon School Award for the little school, and so <clears throat> I, I, I expect that I will have more to share with you about that experience at the November 18th school committee meeting. And just for your um, marking of your calendar, um, January 27th is the date we have selected for kind of a community, little school community celebration of that achievement. Um, we thought that the, the, the selection of that date is not random. It, it um, November became a chance. We, we felt like we didn't want to really do anything until we went to the ceremony and actually have some of the the, um, um, whatever they're gonna present us with, whether it's, I think, I think it's a plaque, I know it's a plaque, but there might be some other things. So we thought it would be nice to, to have those in hand. And then December just became very difficult to schedule something. And, and we, we reached out to Governor Baker's office and provided him with a number of dates then, that we thought could work on our end and in the hope that he would be able to attend. And he is able to attend and he will be attend. So just January 27th is the date that that he picked of the ones that we offered. So, um, you know, I think that was, we, we wanted to extend some flexibility to be able to accommodate his schedule. I think it's a nice thing for the governor to, 
to come to and, and show his his support and, and, and recognition of the award. So um, there'll be, you know, I think I sent out a, a save the date already to all of you and some other folks in the community, but we'll, there'll be something <coughs> formal coming, but we wanted people to have that in their calendar. So is so. that going to happen before the school committee meeting? It's in the morning. It's in the morning. 9.30 a.m. It's at 9.30. It's yeah. in the evening. Well before. Yeah. A.m. 9.30 a.m. Yes. Yeah. 9.30 p.m. I'm already in place. You and I both. <laughs> so that's my report for you tonight. Great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Enjoy the Thank trip. You. Thank you. <laughs> that mean, uh, Mr. Connolly's highest ranking Mr. official. Connolly is, uh, he's the, uh, what's that, lone survivor? Is that uh -uh. The, I was just going to make that joke. <laughs> designated, yeah. survivor. Designated, oh, yeah. designated survivor. Designated survivor. Designated survivor, right, yeah. <laughs> Wrong movie. Okay. Uh, no correspondence, Mr. Bernard? No, sir. Okay, future business. We have a meeting on November 18th back here at 6.30 p.m. Um, December 9th at 6.30 p.m. We have a meeting at the Hood School, so we begin our, uh, Start our tour. begin our tour. J January 13th, we have a meeting back here, and then... January 27th, we have a meeting at the Batchelder School. So, I entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Unanimous.